All right. Well, good morning. We gave you a minute or so there to kind of find your seats and get ready here. Hey, we are ready to start our Missions Emphasis Month. And a verse that we talked about even this past Wednesday, we had a study in 2 Corinthians 8. I'd like to point you to 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 5, where it's talking about their giving. Paul is observing some of their giving, and he says to them, this they did, their giving, not as we hoped, but this is the most important part of giving right here in this verse. But first gave their own selves to the Lord. And not an end unto us by the will of God. So they gave themselves to the Lord first. That's what we would like you to do as we begin this missions emphasis month. Give yourself to the Lord. And from that will come everything else that the Lord wants you to do in terms of your missions giving. So as we think about the subject of missions and our responsibility to send the light, we're going to sing that song now. I invite you to stand as we begin our service, number 424. There's a call comes ringing over the restless wave, and we're going to sing that now. 424, send the light, send the light. There's a call comes ringing over the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. Blessed gospel light, let us shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light. The Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. Welcome to March. Where's the year gone already? We're already this far into 2021. Yes, I can say that now, can I? Hey, I'm glad to see you here today for our service. And some of you haven't seen in quite a while. It's really good to have you back in person. I know uh, many of you have been on virtually. We have some folks joining us virtually still today, I'm sure. But we want to welcome each one of you here to the service. And I'm so glad to be able to be back. Many of you prayed for our family as we were away last week. And God uh, really met our needs, gave us travel mercies. But I'm really glad to be back here. If you can't say it, tell. I've, I've said that like four times now. I'm just really glad to be back here at our home church, First Baptist Church. Church of Westminster. And uh, March is, is already here upon us. My wife was laughing at me yesterday because I made some kind of comment about March is already here and I have to get on top of it. I have to figure out what's going on with March. I'm still, you know, 
thinking about crazy week and recovering from all of that. But March is going to be a wonderful time to serve the Lord. We're coming into spring, uh, prime time, and so this is going to be a time for us to think about what Christ has done for us. We had a tremendous uh, outreach kickoff yesterday. We were able to go out into the neighborhood and visit with folks and see some follow-up happening and reach some people, and it's just a blessing to see a church that cares enough to go out. I appreciated, uh, Pastor Ward, the comment you had on the back of the Faith Promise thing that you're handing out to help explain a little bit of the principles behind that. You know, if we don't have somebody as a neighbor in heaven, the only reason basically what that quote says is it's because we didn't tell them, and we want to see them there. And yesterday was a tremendous time to do that as a church family. We had folks praying. We had folks getting materials ready. We had teams out saturating, teams knocking on doors. We had teams following up, and God's just uh, opened some doors for us to have some, I hope, eternally impactful conversations with people because that's what matters. And so we also began this morning our training for service for Sunday school teacher training. I started this class. It will go through August, the end of August, because we're looking forward to our uh, Sunday school kickoff in the fall. So if you're interested in a basic overview of the Bible, let me invite you to join me on Sunday mornings at 930 upstairs. Uh, We'll be teaching that class from now till August. And that'll be a great help. It's also uh, available for certification. If you want a certificate when you're done, I've got some materials you can answer and uh, we'll put that certificate in your hands so that you can be trained for service. Amen. And uh, also the nursery is looking for helpers. If you'd like to help with that, please uh, see uh, Mrs. Michelle Mathern or my wife, uh, Mrs. Walker, and they can help you get plugged in there. Outreach kickoff. I mentioned that yesterday. Now, let me tell you about next Saturday. I always prefer to make this announcement in the fall because, well, daylight savings time is here, and I just don't like being the one to tell you you have to lose an hour of sleep. So, but that's next Saturday. Make sure, next Sunday, I should say, but get ahead of the game because we don't want folks showing up late for church. It happens, I know, but just go ahead and take care of it on Saturday. That's good advice. Set your clocks ahead and you'll just be ahead all day for Saturday. And then when Sunday comes around church time, you'll be here right when you need to be. Amen. So daylight savings time. And then our missions banquet will be March 21st. Mark your calendar. It'll be after the morning service. So we'll have our morning service. We'll have a a great missions banquet for that afternoon. And uh, then there will be no evening service on March 21st. Then March 28th, we have a special missionary coming. Is it the Abernathy? Patton. I'm sorry, I saw Abernathy somewhere else. Patton will be here with us on March 28th for the evening service, and we'll get an update from them for the mission field. But this is our Faith Promise emphasis time through the year, and it's exciting to be able to give to the work of God because as Pastor Larson said yesterday morning, we may not be able to go to Thailand or another foreign place necessarily, but we can help get the scriptures in their hands. We can give to missionaries that can have boots on the ground. And some of these areas are becoming more closed and it's getting difficult. We have missionaries coming home from the field like we've never seen before. Uh, Other countries in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly they're sending missionaries to the Northern Hemisphere in America. What happened? We've lost a lot of ground. We've lost a lot of ground but we've got to take care of home base. And I think that speaks to a lot of what's gone on. We haven't had a strong home base like we once did, and now we see the impacts of that. But there's still souls that need to be saved, and we need to reach them with the gospel. So help us here in our Jerusalem, but don't stop there. We need to be witnesses unto the ends of the earth. And that begins, as we said earlier in the service, we give ourselves first to God. So as we commit this time to the Lord, would you pray with me? And let's bow together and ask the Lord to bless our mission's emphasis. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for this place. We do not take it for granted, Lord. If the past uh, year has taught us anything, it has shown us how precious a place like this is. To be able to have a physical building to come to and assemble and worship. Lord, to be able to do that in person. There's so much we have to be thankful for the health that you've given for us to be able to be here today watching over us, Lord. Um, The things that you've done to help us be prepared already for what we're doing in this mission's emphasis. 
And as we give ourselves first to You, we want to stop just right now, Lord, and do exactly that. You are why we're here, Lord, for no other reason. You've given us another day to serve You. You've given us Your house to be in. You've given us one another to lift each other up and bear one another's burdens. But Lord, You've also given us a command. You've given us a great opportunity here in Northwest Denver and really around the globe, Lord, to impact lives for our testimony for Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that You would begin even now, if You haven't already, stir the hearts of Your people. May they take some time to be prayerful through this month, anticipating that by the time everything comes in on April 4th, what's done would be to Your glory, Lord. And as each one of us has been blessed by You, may we purpose in our heart, everyone, nobody lacking, nobody left behind, in it together for the work of the Gospel. Lord, may each of us take time through this month in particular to purpose in our heart and determine how we can pay it forward for souls that need salvation by giving ourselves first to You and then getting involved in our local church here with the Faith Promise Mission Program. I pray You'll bless this service, the preaching of Your Word, that it would go forth unhindered, that we would have the fullness of Your Spirit, that Lord, when we leave this place, we'd be able to say, it was good for me to have been in the house of the Lord. Bless Your people, Lord, and we'll thank You for what You do as we serve You together. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 I'll go where You want me to go, Lord. 440. I'm going to ask Brother Mike Johnson. He leads our music, our choir, special music around here. He's going to come and lead us in this next congregational. 440. I'll go where you want me to go. Brother Mike. I'll allow you to remain seated as we sing, as we begin this song. On the third verse, I'll ask you to stand once we get to that point, uh, but we'll remain seated as we begin. Number 440. It may not be on the mountain's height or over the stormy sea. It may not be at the battle's front, my Lord will have need of me. But if by a still small voice he calls, paths I do not know. I'll answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain or plain or sea. you to stand as a sign of dedication to the Lord that this is the thought of your heart as well on the third as the choir comes up as well on the third there's surely somewhere a lonely place in earth's harvest field so wide where I may labor through life's short day for Jesus the I'll do 
seated you know and a thought we need to keep in mind is our Lord's coming and that's reason for us to be out there doing the work of the Lord and we'll work until Jesus comes but when Jesus comes as the choir is going to sing now what a day that will be can't wait. You know what? I, <laughs> I, my heart is stirred sometimes when I think about that thought. Have I done enough in preparation for the Lord's coming that it's, or am I so tied to this world? Maybe you think about it that way, that maybe the, the thought of that is maybe a little less clear to think of how glorious that day is going to be. But all, all the more reason now to want the Lord to be the central part of your life in all that you say and do. And so we're going to sing our last song now as a congregation. I think another good song of dedication of ourselves to the Lord. Number 334, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Number 334, we'll sing all the verses. And I'll invite you to remain seated as we sing and contemplate the words to this song. Number 334. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thoughts by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my
what God's heart is. God's heart is to reach the world that we live in with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are many people who go around the world and do just that. And as part of our Missions Emphasis Month, we hope to better inform you about some of the people who are doing that very thing. Uh, in fact, even on our Wednesday night services, we're talking about some of those missionaries already. So for all the services during the month of March, we're going to present to you some of the ministries of these missionaries that are going out and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Brother Tim Sinks, who helps with our missions, uh, is going to come and present to us a couple more of our missionaries. Thank you. Um, uh, just one today, we'll, we'll be talking about the patents to um, Dominican Republic. Uh, please remember, as we have all mentioned this morning about Missions Emphasis Month and to be praying for our missionaries, uh, we have our prayer list where we can uh, look at those missionaries, what fields they represent. Please continue to pray for them. And then also I want to draw your attention to the missionary screen that's out in the vestibule. That's pretty new, and uh, those will uh, cycle through the different missionaries that we have. A missionary will be up on there for about 30 seconds. You can peruse the letter, uh, look things over, and then it'll, it'll go on to a next missionary. It's not interactive, so you can't touch the screen and, and swipe. It's not a telephone. It won't do any of that stuff. <laughs> so um, uh, I hope you'll enjoy that, and I hope you'll take the time to look that over as well. So uh, the patents are our uh, missionaries for our uh, focused missionary for the month of March. And uh, they will be here, as, as uh, Pastor Walker had mentioned, they'll be here March 28th in the evening. I hope you will be uh, excited about meeting them. And uh, as they present the field of the Dominican Republic, their church is the First Baptist Church of Vista Catalina. And uh, just a few things that he writes uh, in uh, the letter. The letter is out on the board in the vestibule. He says, we closed 2020 and then began 2021. Our lives have certainly seen plenty of changes as we have returned to begin furlough. So they did this in December. Um, end of December, they, they left La Romana and their church, Vista Catalina, and um, uh, flew to the United States. He says the house was packed up, new members were uh, were baptized, the kids had their exams, Christmas parties, and a lot of visiting people to say goodbye. The church leadership has taken over as we are on furlough, we know they will do a great job. He says our, fur our furlough tours officially began on the first Sunday of the year. Uh, it has been quite an adjustment traveling around together during these times, but we are getting there. The kids are in road school online uh, live streaming in the van or in hotels or mission apartments. Uh, and he says, when he wrote this letter, they're still on Dominican time. So that was like the end of December, 1st of January. So they're, they're getting up at like 6 in the morning to do their school and so forth. I'm sure by now they've, they've converted to regular time. He says, we visited 14 churches in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and Texas in January. And there is a good uh, long road ahead. He says, please be in prayer for safety and traveling. He says, the church in La Romana sends their greetings. Uh, the floor plans for the new building should be done in a month or so. And he says, please be in prayer for them during this time and for more souls to be saved. So we hope that you will consider the patents in your regular prayers this, uh, this month, as well as our other missionaries. We will take just a moment now to pray for them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you in prayer and bring the patents, a missionary family to the Dominican Republic before you as they are on furlough this year, uh, going uh, traveling, driving, going to so many different places. We ask, Lord, that you would give them safe traveling mercies, help them to um, be able to accomplish the tasks that they have as they report to churches. And we look forward to seeing them March 28th as they report to us. But also, we look forward to see all the, uh, the wonderful blessings that, uh, that have occurred during their ministry time there in La Romana. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, help us to pray for them, to be thinking of them, um, that uh, as they go to different churches 
and share their heart, their burden, that we might be a part of that. And hopefully as they, as they um, go to different churches and report, that also they would be able to uh, find new support to help them in the ministry in the Dominican Republic. We ask, Lord, you would just direct this month for the patents, specifically and specially. Help us to pray for them. Bring their name to you continually. That God will bless their ministry. And in so doing, we can be a part of what the patents are doing in the Dominican Republic. And we'll thank you for this. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, I can say a word of testimony about the song now that they've got it playing. I'll let them catch up with me because they need to follow the, the singer, right? So you can start it over here in just a minute, fellas, now that you're on cue, hopefully. Um, this song is near and dear to my heart for uh, the reason that I, I knew it as a young man, a young Christian. This is one of the first ones that I really came to know in the home church I had in Georgia. And we used to sing it all the time down there. You sing it Southern style. We even had the shape notes in the hymnal. It was the old Redback Church hymnal. Some of you know what I'm talking about there. And, uh, and I may not do it as good a justice as some of those folks could do it in my church back home, but I'll give it my best. And I'm thankful for Brother Mike here singing the truth of this song. Don't let it escape your heart and mind that what Jesus did for us on Calvary, he set me free. Like a bird in prison I dwelt No free... No, I'm off, all right. Start it over. I built you up, now I have to do it right. Y'all pray for us when you practice this much. Once like a bird in prison I dwelt no freedom from my sorrow I felt But Jesus came and listened to me And glory to God, He set me free He set me free, yes, He set me free And He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound by Jesus to see For glory to God, I set At this time, we'll have our children dismissed for our children's service. I believe my wife should be available. Here she is. And so she'll uh, lead you upstairs for your class area where you can join her for a children's service. And at this time, we, I'll, I'll ask Pastor Ward if you'll come and preach the Word of God. I felt rather Bapticostal. I was ready to start jumping around and flailing my arms. I tell you, I was ready to get after it. And uh, uh, I don't know about you, but it, did you notice... All the songs this morning, uh, and how talking about similar things that we talked to you in the adult Sunday school class about sincerity in our hearts, uh, and that we 
Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to say from a sincere heart? It's really all about our heart. And that's what we're trying to do uh, today, or th- this month is really about our hearts. Uh, so we got to shake off the ashes and, and have the Holy Spirit breathe some, some uh, life back into these hearts uh, that have gotten a little cold over the year. Uh, we find ourselves just getting a little uh, tied back into other things. And we need to be reminded of what's important. Uh, we have the Great Commission, uh, but without us, that Great Commission isn't going to go anywhere. Um, in each one of you or each family should have been handed a little folder beside your insert, uh, the prayer list, uh, about faith promise mission giving. And uh, how I preach this message and what goes on kind of depends on this next question. How many of you are familiar with faith promise mission giving? Let me see your hands. Most everyone. There's a few that aren't. And so what I'm going to do then is I'm not going to go through all of it. You have it. You can read it. It tells you about faith promise mission giving. I know uh, Broomfield Baptist Church uh, use faith promise mission giving. It's just a way of emphasizing missions. Um, and First Baptist Church of Westminster has as well. And now that we're one, we're going to combine what we were doing. But faith promise mission giving is simply a method of missionary giving by individuals through First Baptist Church of Westminster. And it's really not some clever gimmick. And now you can follow along within that. I'm really kind of going through uh, the points of what it is, but that's what faith faith promise mission giving. Sometimes you'll see uh, the letters F. PMG in bulletins and things like that. That's what that's talking about. And it's not some clever gimmick. Uh, I'm not trying to get a way to lighten your wallet or your purse, though I hope that's what happens. Um, it's, it's a principle of faith giving, even promising to give. Now, you're not promising me. You're not promising Pastor Jason. Uh, you're not promising anyone in here. You're promising God. And that's the part to keep in mind, is that we don't want to be caught lying to God or we'll be filling up this pulpit area uh, during our services. Uh, We are making a promise to God, and we don't want it to become some gimmick. It's not what this is about. It's really about God working in your heart that he should already be doing. And then the second one is uh, while we're giving, and I'm not going to go to the verses. You can look these all up at 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, uh, was a charitable, a benevolent giving uh, and with missionary implications. The Macedonian believers, again, Pastor Larson used it yesterday, Saturday morning, and how that uh, they first gave of themselves to the Lord. You know, there's the key. You give yourself to Jesus, and the other stuff will come along with it. Uh, and so right then you can ask yourself, uh-oh, Because you say, I gave myself to Jesus, but I don't care much about missions. There's a problem. It's a heart problem. Doesn't mean you're not saved. It's your heart's probably cooled off a bit. And that's why we emphasize today, let's let's get those hearts on fire again. Let's have a flame in our heart. Let's get hot for Jesus. And we do that by supporting others. And then we see that faith promise mission giving, it's based on a one-year commitment. That's how we do it. You've been, there's a card in there. There's no place for your name. We don't want to know your name. God knows your name. He knows the hairs on your head. You can't fool him. You can't hide from him. And so it's a one-year commitment, remembering, though, that once we get them on the field, they're going to stay on the field. So really, the commitment goes from year to year to year. But people move. Things happen. Uh, We have a commitment to this local church because we're still... We promised those missionaries, we're taking them on and we want to take care of them. And so it's about a one-year commitment. You can look at at the card. It's set up monthly. Um, Just put in the amount. If it's not already there, I think it stops at $50. I don't have the card with me. So when you're doing $500 a month or something, you can write that in. You look at me like I'm kidding. Man, I thought that was the beginning thing. We just start there. No, I am teasing. But it's a one-year commitment. Uh, 
And it's a commitment you've made between you and the Lord. Uh, it's over and above your tithes and regular contributions. So it's going, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to give $400 to missions, uh, but now my tithe is going to be 50 bucks. No, this is over and above. And so uh, because there's no command to give to missions, they gave out of their lack. And you can see other churches didn't give. Out of their lack, they weren't able to or didn't. Uh, but this poor church in Macedonia did. And so uh, we should, as the God has worked in our hearts, uh, and so it's above your tithes and your regular contributions to the church. It's uh, normally not designed to be a specific missionary. Please don't be making them out. If you want to send money to a missionary, a specific missionary, that's on your own. We, the money comes in, goes into our mission account, because we can't pick and choose. If we pick and choose everybody, somebody may go without. And that's not right. We give our missionaries, we determine what amount of money we're going to give them, and that's what we're going to give them. And you might say, well, I like the patents, and all the money goes to the patents. Well, how do we take care of the others? And so um, it goes into the missions account, and then we pay all our missionaries. Uh, it's not a pledge. I know Pastor Jason is... He makes a point of this every time. He goes, it's not a pledge. And I'm going, you're right, it's not a pledge. It's not a pledge. That's a legal contract. This is a promise between you and God. It's that simple. So it's not a pledge. It's between you, the giver, and the Lord. And he'll never, uh, you'll never be asked for it. I'm not going to remind you. That's why I don't want names on your cards. We do look at the cards, we add them up so that we can see that uh, during a business meeting, we might we be able to bring on new missionaries. Um, it just helps us in our planning. Uh, but I won't, or Pastor Jason won't, or no one should be asking, ooh, you haven't given any money this month. Uh, this isn't like some churches that make a point of calling people up when the, they haven't done what they said they're going to do. And so it's between you and the Lord. And it depends not on our ability to give, but on our faith to God to provide. And I think that's, that's the faith part of faith promise mission giving. Is that if the Lord puts it on your heart, whatever it might be. Now I'm going to make a recommendation. How many of you drink lattes kind of thing? Only a couple of you. Well, then this isn't going to work good as an illustration. So I'm going to have to, uh, how many of you drink a Coors? Okay, no one there. Well, that's good, because I'd have you give that up anyways. Find something that you can give up that you kind of do habitually, um, like a latte, and give that up for a week. That's like five or six bucks. If you go to Starbucks, you're going to blow six bucks on a coffee that doesn't taste that great anyways, from an organization that hates you anyhow. And so don't spend that $6 on coffee to someone that doesn't like you. Give it to the Lord. Give it to missions. And you do that once a month, and that's $20, $30 a month, and you, all you're doing is saving yourself some calories and lose a couple pounds. I mean, it's all good. And so uh, uh, trust God. If he puts something on your heart, and it be asking him. I've already been praying. Okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? I... I support faith promise mission giving. And as the Lord stirs my heart, my wife's heart will then talk. And she'll say, well, you know, what's kind of the Lord putting on your heart? And I go, well, this is kind of where I'm leaning. And, and most, almost every time we come with the same number. Uh, because the Holy Spirit isn't going to say, well, give a thousand dollars. Oh, I was going to give a thousand pennies. Uh, no, it's not going to be like that. The Holy Spirit works within the family when we go to them. Uh, go to the Holy Spirit, and it's and it may say, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I need my latte. I need my whatever it is. Uh, or we don't have that. I can't buy chrome for my motorcycle. Uh, nothing like that. God will provide. He's promised that. And so uh, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Uh, trust in faith and not your ability because God will take care of it. Now, don't be a poor steward and just go, well, I'm going to give 50% of everything I have to missions and then your children go without clothing and they can't eat right. That's not God. Uh, it's reasonable. God will change your heart about things that are important to you. 
And so uh, it's not about your ability to give, but your faith in God to provide. And then uh, it talks as well about that faith promise mission giving should be motivated by our love for the Lord. As in 2 Corinthians 8, 8, he said, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of forwardness or willingness of others, and to provide the sincerity, oh, we're going already back to sincerity, uh, of your love. And also by heart gladly yielded to him. So we're motivated by our love. God loves a cheerful giver. And so um, we should do it because we love him. And if we love him, then we love our brethren. And we love a lost and dying world because, you know, we were all a part of that not maybe so long ago. And aren't you glad someone loved you enough to get, share the gospel with you? They may not recognize it at the time. I look forward to a time with my uh, my wife's aunt, Aunt Mabel, who I didn't like. She was a Baptist and we were Lutherans. I mean, yeah, I was a good Lutheran. I, heard, I went to church on Christmas and Easter. And I was a pretty good guy, or better than the thief down the street. And uh, and I got saved, and we went and visited her. And she said, you know, Lord, I've been praying for you for 20 years. And I got saved, and, and I, it, I have a hard time even saying it yet today, is that she prayed for me for 20 years out of love for the Lord. And then when I surrendered to preach, uh, the joy that I could see in her, that God was not only called me to be saved, but called me to preach. And it's because of that woman's love for the Lord. She's put tracks in all of our Christmas cards and all the stuff that we had. We just hated her. She was the black sheep of the family, but it was because of her, her prayers and her love for the Lord. And so it's about our love for God. And faith promise mission giving is good for the believer and is good for our church. The word expedient in 2 Corinthians 8.10, it means good or advisable in the interest of oneself. It's good for us to do what we know we're supposed to do. It's good for our church. God blesses our church. I was talking to Susie yesterday about it. How many folks we got coming on a Saturday? I mean, you could go to a church a lot bigger than ours and not see that many people showing up to put stuff together, John and Romans, knock doors, all of those things that we're doing, follow-ups. God's doing something here because I believe part of it is because we have a heart for missions. The Great Commission. God said, go, and this is how we go. We go ourselves where we can in our Jerusalem, and where we can't, we send others. And so it's beneficial for us. God has blessed our church. I'm looking around today at how many folks are here. And I can't wait to see this time next year. I'm excited. We're already, Pastor Jason and I, we're going, well, what wall's got to go out? And what are we, how are we going to deal with it? We're already planning for the 2,000 people that are going to be here in the next few years. <laughs> And so, uh, uh, you know, you got to have a vision, and we do have a vision, but without fulfilling God's vision, he'll never fulfill our vision. And so uh, it'll be good for us in our local church. And this is the P in faith promise mission giving is promise. Let your yea be a yea and your nay, nay. You don't need to make a vow. If you're a Christian of integrity, which we are all to be, then when you say yes to something, or I will do this, or I won't do this, then do that, whatever that is. And if it's, Lord, I don't feel that you've called me to give anything to missions, and I don't believe that, uh, don't give. And that's okay. But if you say, yes, Lord, I'm going to give $10 a week or $10 a month or $30 or $100 or whatever it might be. If you say you're going to do it, then do it because you're making a promise to God. That's the promise of our faith promise mission giving. And God not only encourages us to give, he will supply our gift. 
He gives the promise of blessing in Ephesians 1.3 with heavenly blessings. You may not see material blessings out of this. I believe he does. Uh, but he has promised us heavenly blessings. And so don't worry about the stuff in this life. It's fleeting. It's momentary. It's going to go away. But what God has us lay up in store in heaven and that's missions. As souls get saved, I want to believe, I, there's nothing to support it, but I believe when we get to heaven, there'll be people come up and tap us on the shoulder and say, thank you for supporting these missionaries. Thank you for handing me a tract. Our God will honor us. He'll honor our churches. And then finally, faith promise mission giving includes every member of the family in every age group. Now, we only gave one card to each family. There's cards in the back. Encourage your children, your grandchildren, others, everyone for Faith Promise Mission Giving. What we do, our children see. And if they see us giving faithfully, not only in our tithes and special offerings, but in our Faith Promise Mission Giving, then it'll be important to them. We can start, you know, put a penny, a nickel, a quarter, a dime, whatever is reasonable for them. Teach them. As I'm trying to teach for those that aren't familiar with faith promise mission giving is here, or those that have not participated in the past. I don't believe that there is any reason that everyone here can't do something. And uh, the Lord will bless us. Faith promise mission giving is our biblical way to meet the command of Jesus to his churches as well as a logical and an orderly, because our God is not an, a God of confusion. All things are to be done decently and in good order. And this is our way of having good order in collecting the funds necessary to fulfill the Great Commission. And it's important. Uh, as on the back sign, that's been there a long time, we need to change. It says, God's mission is our greatest ministry. We sometimes think it's, it's the music ministry and it's the audiovisual ministry and it's this and it's that. No, it's the Great Commission. With, if we don't fulfill the Great Commission, we will no longer be a New Testament Bible-believing church. There are a lot that are churches, but they're not, they're not real churches. If you don't support missions, you got to ask yourself why. And so your insert that you have there says these same things. You can read it. You can look up the verses of Scripture. And so I challenge each and every one of you through the month, be praying about this. Don't just pass it off and fill out the card. Think about it. Pray about it. Do as God puts in your heart to do. And you will be blessed through it. Our church will be blessed through it. And a lost world will be blessed through it. That's our faith promise mission giving. And so I'm going to now have you open your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark chapter four. And now my time is a little more limited. And so, uh, but we'll get her done this week. Mark chapter four. I'm going to read verses one through 13. I'll be reading a few more verses after that. Um, but Mark chapter four, beginning in verse one. It says, And he began again to teach by the seaside, and there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Now, interesting, this is just a little gee whiz. But you notice how he said there was this great gathering, this multitude, and they entered into a ship and sat in the sea. Did you ever think about why he would do that? A couple reasons. One is that there was a whole lot of folks there. And he was running out of room. They were kind of pushing in on him. And he's kind of being backed up into the uh, closer and closer to the water. But also the natural, and this is a scientific principle. I don't know what the name is of it is. But you go out onto a lake in a boat and you whisper to the people that are in a boat. And boy, the people on land hear exactly what you say. I made the mistake of doing that with fishing. Uh, I'd go fishing. We'd have our little rowboat. We'd go out into the lake, and Susie and I were dating, and we'd say, 
sweet things to one another, and then I find out that everybody on shore heard everything we said. <laughs> and so uh, God, he used his own scientific principles as a megaphone so he could have everyone hear. So you think, well, these things don't mean much. No, they all mean something. And so uh, they were able to listen to what he had to say. And that's why he entered that ship at the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. Uh, verse 2 then, And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in this doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. They're talking about they were an agricultural uh, group of folks. And uh, they would understand these kind of terms. We may not quite be so. So he's talking about farming. And, it's, and it came to pass, as he sowed, and that word sowed is talking about broadcasting. You hear about broadcasting stations. They broadcast, like broadcasting seed in the old days, they'd scatter it, they'd reach into a bag, and they would just scatter the seed. Today we have drills and things that they put one seed in each place. It's all measured, very scientific. It wasn't that way then, uh, but it's like broadcasting. Ooh, well, I feel like I'm the boat in the lake. And, uh, and so that's what it's talking about here. And so and it came to pass as he sowed, some, uh, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on the stony ground where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on ground, uh, good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray, most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again. We just thank you for the privilege to come to this place to worship you. But Father, to worship you today is to have a right heart motivated to love you first, and then to love our neighbors as ourselves, and that we would reach them with our faith promise mission giving, that we can bring on new missionaries and take care of the missionaries that we already support. But Father, through this, that you be worshipped, that you be revered, that we lift you up through your own word. Speak to the hearts of your people, for Father, we need an awakening in our hearts. We need a revival. We need the Holy Spirit to blow those cold ashes off of our heart that we have a glow once again within us for the things of God. Father, speak to your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as we see this great multitude people, they're, they're gathered together. They, have the, uh, they can hear well. They have these better acoustics as Jesus is out on the sea. And we see a parable about farming to help them understand, to help us understand uh, the principle that's being taught here. Now we're giving a little more in the next few verses, verses 13 through 25. It says, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stone, uh, stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have not root in themselves and so endure, but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it become unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, which as hear the word and receive it, bring forth fruit, some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. So we see here that the sower soweth his seed in verse 14. And it's good seed. 
It's the Word of God. That's the only truly good seed that we have. And it must be sown. We can tell as well in the parable of the uh, tares in Matthew uh, chapter 13, uh, speaks about the seed being good seed. And so it's the word of God, and the sower soweth it. So the farmer, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ in this instance, but also applies to each and every one of us, has to sow the seed, broadcast the seed, cast it out. Some effort involved. And it has to be done well and right, or we'll see some problems as we'll see come up. And so that sower, Christ, though not specifically mentioned here, but we do see in Matthew 13, 37, it says the Son of Man. So it's tying that in with Jesus. And therefore, I believe it then applies to us as well as he uh, gave us the Great Commission. We then are to be the farmers, the sowers of the good seed, the Word of God, uh, to uh, help with the uh, increase the harvest. Many times, we kind of want to stop with sowing the seed only. But as the title of the message, and I haven't given it to you yet, is a great harvest depends on the soil. The soil has to be prepared, or you can broadcast, you can sow the seed everywhere. If the soil is not prepared, things aren't going to happen the way they should. And it's explained here in our text. And so it applies to all of us as God's servants, and we're to prepare the ground for the sower, uh, as the Holy Spirit works within the hearts. But we too have to, as we do on Saturday, we send out uh, teams that will put out door hangers. And then the door knocking crew will go out. And then the follow-up crew will go out. And then there's people back praying and people making up more door hangers for the next time we go out, all in preparation. The farmer just doesn't jump in his tractor, set down his plow, or, or I'm sorry, set, uh, set down his drill and start planting seed. The ground has to be prepared. And we all want to see a harvest. But if we don't prepare the ground, if it's not prepared, not much is going to happen. It'll be hindled, hindered what can happen. A farmer doesn't just plow only. He plows to plant. And then he has to weed and to water for a harvest. And it takes time. And the soil needs to be prepared. Jesus uses the seed as the word of God. As seed has life and power in itself, out of seeds come the life of a plant. Through the word of God, it plants a seed, the word of life, how people can be saved. Just like the word of God, it's alive and it gives life. It speaks to us of salvation, eternal life, and how to live our lives for God. Out of the word of God comes new life to men to be born again. And the good seed must be planted on properly prepared soil. First of all, it says they had all one thing in common. They all heard the word of God. They all heard it. We have many people in our neighborhood and in Thornton and in Broomfield and in Arvada and in... Uh, Commerce City and Lakewood and all the places around us, but not everyone has heard. It's our job to try and see that they hear the word of God. Faith cometh by what? Hearing. We need to share the word of God. They need to hear it in their hearts, whether it's from our spoken word, more importantly, through the word of God, the printed word, with tracks, with door hangers, they all need to hear it. These folks, they all heard it. He made himself the megaphone out there on the lake so everyone would hear. They couldn't say, I didn't hear that. They heard it. And so there's no excuse for not being saved. When people, once they hear it, you know, they might, they don't have a problem with you 
until you share the word of God. Once you've shared it, it's their responsibility. You've done your part. If they actually, they can get real mad if they find out what it really means because now it's on them. Before they can claim, well, I didn't know. I never heard it. Once they hear it, it's on them. They have absolute responsibility. We need to do what we can. There is no excuse for not being saved because they heard it. These people that were saved didn't lose their salvation, nor the ones that weren't saved, they didn't lose their salvation either because you can't lose salvation. They never were saved to start with. I think of John chapter 3, verse 18, it says, He that believeth not is condemned already. Everyone is already condemned by believing not in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, they can't lose their salvation if you were never saved to start with. But they need to hear the word of God to be saved. They sowed the seed broadcast it along the way, and that on the edges of the fields as they prepared the fields. I remember even when I worked out on the farm, even with a tractor, uh, I wasn't very precise in getting the, uh, the plow down into the ground. And uh, I'd get my row straight, pick out my uh, point, and plow toward it, and I have straight rows, but when I drop the blade at the ends of the field or pick the blade up, uh, sometimes the blade wouldn't go as deep in at one place or the other, or it wouldn't start exactly at the same spot. So there's parts around the edge of the uh, prepared field that aren't as prepared. And, uh, and so when you put seed out, the seed then doesn't get to go down in the, the exact depth that it needs to go for the right amount of sunlight, the right amount of nutrients and moisture and all of those things. And it's the same even back then, is as they scratched the ground, prepared it, however they prepared it, uh, they weren't able to, uh, the seed when they scattered it, some got on hard ground, it wasn't prepared at all, some that it was just scratched a little bit. And so the ground had different levels of preparation. And, uh, and so those on the wayside, uh, were immediately taken away from out of the soil. It's kind of like man's heart that's not prepared. That they hear the word of God, but immediately it's taken away. I've seen that. You've probably all seen that in places. They, they hear the word of God. They come to a church service, and they hear the word of God preached. But immediately, before they even get to respond to it, it's taken away. And the Bible tells us through his word that it's the devil takes it away because it's on that unprepared ground. They showed up to church because they really came to get free food from our, from our uh, food pantry. They weren't there for the right reason. Their heart wasn't prepared. And it's quickly snatched away as it is in a man's heart. And that wayside is that hard packed path. And they, they, they would walk the edges of the fields and the ground there. And it wasn't worked well enough. And so when that seed fell, nothing happened to it. It didn't get into the prepared soil. And it was easy picking for birds. My wife, I've, it's been some time, but she had planted some sunflower seeds. And, uh, and not all the ground was prepared perfectly. And as soon as she threw out the seed, the blackbirds came in and snatched it away. Well, in that same sense, the seed of the word of God is snatched away by the devil. We see that within the scripture. And nothing happens. And so the birds spoken of are the type of Satan and the devil. And he immediately took away the seed of the word from these persons' hearts, just as those blackbirds with Susie's sunflower seeds. They heard it, but it's about what's being done with the word, the seed that's important. They have to hear it and understand it. They didn't understand. It was snatched away before they could do anything. And we know why. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he understand them, for they are spiritually discerned. That's why man's heart needs to be as prepared as the sower with his seed, the farmer. 
And if it's not, the natural man will reject it. Who needs God? I just want your food. Or I just want to come to church and be religious. I'm going to trust in my religion to meet my spiritual needs. It's that way with the word of God in the natural person's life. As soon as it's heard, it's taken out of that hard, thick heart of some. I was told of some illustrations of some people heard the word of God on Saturday and rejected it outright. Nothing, they heard it. But now they have a responsibility. They can't, when they, when they, get to, when they pass from this life to the next and go, oh, I never heard the word. That's a lie. They've heard it. Now it's up to them to do something with it. And so the responsibility is on them, but we have a responsibility to share it, to be sowers of the word. The seed sown that fell on stony ground immediately germinated and sprang up in verses 16 and 17 of our text. Some of the land in uh, Palestine is known for shallow topsoil, much like Wyoming and Nebraska and maybe some parts here. I'm not that familiar with Colorado. Shallow topsoil. And, uh, and if you don't get down below that uh, topsoil down into the clay and the things that's down there and, and take care of it and prepare it with nutrients and fertilizer and all those things, uh, things just aren't going to grow well. But they will start because they get a little bit of topsoil. And they'll germinate. That seed will take off right away. You'll see almost immediately the little seeds start to open up and things start to happen. But then... Because it's shallow topsoil and it wasn't prepared well, that it withers away when the sun comes down and hits it. And it may have been received with joy. You're going, oh man, my crop's going to come up. I'm going to have 30 bushels of wheat uh, per acre on my, on my farm here. And, uh, but it was never put at the right depth. But it started to come up and man, we're excited. Uh, we have joy in our hearts about it. But quickly, uh, it doesn't develop. Germination began, but without roots. Just like some professing Christians today, looking for an emotional experience. There have been so many times where I saw someone come to church and, and they heard the gospel and they, they walk the aisle. But then within a month, already, they're not coming to church. They grew, they were excited, they received the word of God with joy, and they made a profession of faith, and they, they came to Sunday, or they came to church for two or three weeks, and then it's four weeks till they come again, and six weeks till they come again, and six months, and then they're completely gone. It was shallow, and it withered away. Just like the example that's given to us here. Persecution set in, the sun and the world, the afflictions and trials and the tribulations of life, shaming. Some people can be shamed out of receiving the word. Their faith is not real. It becomes only a head knowledge. The word of God fell on the soil of a heart that was not properly prepared and soon withered under a harsh sun. For a seed, the sun can be a blessing or a curse. For seed planted in shallow ground with little moisture, it simply is destroyed and withers away. But for seed planted properly in prepared ground, the sun helps bring life through its persecution of its rays. Persecution is in a professing only Christian will destroy their faith and will no longer follow Jesus. In John chapter 6 and verse 66, that's what all happened. And they couldn't stand the things that Jesus said. And it said that then they quit walking with him. How sad. Their faith withered away. But for the born-again believers, they grow strong through that same persecution. But we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. The seed sown that fell among thorns were choked out, verses 18 and 19. The thorns and the weeds choked out the life of the valuable plant. We can look around in our church property. We got rid of most of our grass. Well, I can't call it grass. We had a weed patch out front before we put the stones in. And what grass would start to grow was choked out by by the weeds, and it became a full weed patch. Well, around our fences, we have to, Brother Ken, sprays the weeds. They come up. 
and it chokes out any other life, any other grass that tries to grow there. And it's the same thing with the uh, Word of God. It gets choked out by the pleasures of the world the, as it uh, uh, seeps in from uh, the pressures around us. And the pressure, it chokes out the Word of God, the good seed, the good news from the hearts of men who would receive it on what was once fertile and prepared ground in their hearts. They are now offended by what they hear. They don't take care. They're anxious about it. The deceitfulness of riches and lusts of other things enter into their hearts and choke the word. That happens. Our priorities get messed up. Sin is no longer sin. Riches become too important. Living in a if-it-feels-good-do-it kind of attitude. They aren't willing to make the sacrifice of turning from the sin in this world. They say things like, well, I'll do the spiritual stuff later. Later may never come. We don't know what's on tomorrow. Now, I'm not dogmatic about this. I've A number of commentaries will say all the first three groups, uh, no one gets saved. But this last, the third group, I believe is people that receive the word and are truly converted but no fruit is seen. Some will say, I know J. Vernon McGee and uh, Warren Wiersbe and a number of them, and I could say it could go either way. It doesn't say to me clearly. But though they heard the word of God, they received it, and they were converted, but there was no fruit. Nothing came of it. There are many Christians or born-again believers. Of course, we don't know their hearts that make a profession of faith, but just sit in a pew. Don't read your Bibles, don't pray, maybe not even sit in a pew, but prayed the prayer. So we got to be a little careful about easy believism. And they may have gotten saved, but they never bear fruit. That's, to me, that third group. Maybe they're really not saved. So that would then mean that three quarters of the folks that hear the word, don't get saved. Aren't you so thankful that you received the word gladly and it stuck with you? It's a small group of folks. That's why our churches aren't packed out. But the seed that was sown and fell on good ground in verse 20, on properly prepared ground, fertile and watered soil, where the seed is received, it will bear fruit. We see that same speaking about in in John chapter 15, that we're to bear fruit, good fruit. And those folks that truly get saved, truly are born again, and the faith is grounded in their hearts, and they let the persecutions strengthen them instead of weaken them, will bear fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100. I often wondered, I talked to my pastor Because when I got saved, I immediately, I mean, I couldn't read the Bible enough. I couldn't pray enough. I couldn't go to church enough. I'd tell my pastor he needs to have more services. Uh, He'd say, I can't hardly do the ones I'm doing. I mean, I just couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough to sing. I couldn't get enough to be around God's people. And then I would see other Christians didn't have that same zeal. And I, I wondered, well, What's up with that? When someone gets saved, they should all feel like me. And I asked my pastor, he said, Brother Ward, you got to remember, God called you to preach. He gave you a little extra. And I started to think about that, and I couldn't help but praise the Lord. Not that I was worthy of it, because I was far from worthy of it. But I'm so thankful that God did give me a little extra. But he expects more out of me. And so we see the fruit, 30, 60, 100. People are given faith in degrees. Doesn't mean that, oh, I got a little faith that can't get more. But God gives us different amounts of faith. Pastors need more faith or we won't stay in the pulpit very long. Lay people need faith and then they need to grow in their faith and the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we produce fruit. And so people need to see that as well. 
we are fruit inspectors. We don't know their hearts, but usually if they're, if they're producing a heart of a joy in reading the word of God, a joy in praying, a joy in serving God's people, coming to church, uh, loving the Lord is, is seen in their lives, that they live lives of grace. Uh, that fruit is seen by everyone. There's a quantity and a quality in those fruits. And though fruit is different for each plant, tree, and vine, some grow more fruit and the quality of the fruit than others. Grow in the word of God and sprout up and mature and produce much fruit. Not some fruit, but all should produce at least something. We're to reproduce ourselves. That's what the gospel does when we go out. Reproducing. People need to see Christ in you and reproduce someone like yourself. We have our children and we try to make them just like us. We need to do the same thing with the world, with ourselves. Make them like us, born-again believers. We don't want them to be exactly like us, maybe in character, but we want them to be uh, that's like us, saved through a personal faith in Jesus Christ. The seed must be sown and fall on that prepared field before it can produce fruit. And I say all this, and I'm going to end because I'm already going longer than I wanted to go. But when we may knock doors or talk to a neighbor or a family member, we want to see harvest right away. There can't be a harvest if there isn't a planning. If you thought with Paul and Apollos, Paul planted Apollos water, but who gave the increase, got the increase? God. It's not about us. Our job is to go out. We need to prepare the ground. We're doing that on Saturday. Sometimes we see some harvest, but sometimes all we're doing is preparing the ground for the next person to come along. And even if it isn't us, that it's ready for the next person. We want to leave then with a good taste in their mouth, so to speak, that they're open and receptive to the next time they hear the word of God that people will get saved. America at one time had its great harvest. The fields were white to harvest and they were harvested. But now there's a time of planning so that we can have a great harvest once again. And so don't be discouraged if you don't see a harvest in your lifetime. But get planning. Start preparing the ground. Plant the seed so someone will see a harvest. There's always volunteer crops coming up that we get to harvest. That's God's job. We just need to go where we can go in our Jerusalem. Next door, across the street, in our Capitol building, wherever that might be, But where we can't go, we send others. And they'll be doing that same thing. And that's why faith promise mission givings and our missions is so important that we fulfill the Great Commission and prepare the soil, prepare the hearts of men so that there can be yet a great harvest. And that's our challenge for each and every one of us throughout this month and hopefully throughout the year. But we need to get working at it. We just can't trust it to happen. If our farmers didn't work hard, we'd all go hungry. And the same with the world. If we don't work hard at preparing the field, preparing the hearts of men, and plant the seed, people will go hungry and they'll hunger and they'll thirst and never receive the true life of Jesus Christ and perish forever. And I wouldn't want that responsibility on my shoulders. And I don't believe you would either. Great harvest depends on the soil. And so is the soil ready? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, again, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you use our messages, you use the songs, God, that you would just use uh, your word especially to 
work in our hearts to take care of the ashes that we've grown cold over time, and especially with COVID-19 and other things that we, we've just cooled off because of the things of the world going on around us. And the devil, which is trying to keep the word of God out of people's hearts. Father, let us not be afraid that we go out boldly on Saturdays. And Lord, our, I'm thankful for those that you've sent out. But Lord, we could use more men and women to go out. Put it in their hearts that we have a fire once again for your word. And that we plant where we can plant that we have crews to go out and prepare the soil to go out before the door knockers go out, that ultimately that there will be a harvest to come in our lifetime, but if not, in the next. Father, work in our hearts as only you can work. Thank you for how good you've been to our church and people in it. And Father, I pray that we will get a burden and a zeal once again to be good sowers of the good word of God that we might see some saved. Thank you, Father, for all those who have come out today. I pray that through these things spoken, that you were glorified. Now, Father, if there's one here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they've not received the good seed, the word of God in their heart, they've heard it, and God help them to receive it, and not to let persecution rob it from them, that it be real in their hearts, that they would have fruit 30, 60, or 100. If there's one like that today, Lord, I pray that during this invitation time, they might come forward and we can show them through your word, the seed, how to be saved. So Father, we lift them up to you. We thank you for today and the opportunity to worship you. And we pray, Father, that you're pleased. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed, no looking around. This is your opportunity to respond to the message there at your seat, here by the pulpit. This is your invitation. God's people said? Amen. Amen. I know I went a little long today. I do. I'm working on trying to be a little shorter in time, but we had a lot to cover this first uh, message. Please keep your um, announcement and the uh, insert. Uh, Read that. Be praying about what God would have you to do. Uh, We have the seed. Now let's be sowers and prepare the ground and get it planted, and we will see a great harvest, and maybe it won't be in our life, but we'll see it in heaven.